JC Direct this week, U.S. inflation has not moved lower since June of last year, nine months. Pick and pay worries, landlords are stressing. Some are, some don't seem to realize. We buy cars, listing date confirmed 11 April, ABSA, poor results. Hello and welcome to JSC Direct, episode 578 for 14 March. My name is Simon Brown. This podcast is brought to you by JustOneLap.com. So I want to kick off first. We're doing a new series on JustOneLap.com. We're speaking to people already in retirement and saying to them, what's your retirement experience like? What's the good? What's the bad? What are the lessons that others can learn? It's going to be about probably eight in the series over every two weeks, so running for a couple of months. Justonelap.com slash retire. You can find those articles there. If you want and you are in retirement and you want to chat about your experience, you can be anonymous. Drop me an email, simon at justonelap.com. So I want to start with that uh, U.S. story, and I think it's, it's quite a biggie. And we had inflation out, 3.2%. I'm focusing on normal CPI. I'm not doing the, the core or anything like that. Uh, and I know that the Fed prefers core and I, the core inflation. But the normal inflation came in at 32 Not bad. Target, of course, 2%. We all know that. Bigger point. It was June last year when they had 3%. In other words, for nine months, U.S. inflation has broadly gone sideways. We had 37 in August and September, uh, back down to 3.1 in November, 3.4 again in December, uh, 3.1 Jan, 3.2 in Feb. U.S. inflation has got stuck. Now, this is how inflation works, right? Your initial down move is relatively easy after a while because quite simply base effect. I remember on this very show about a year ago saying local inflation will fall quite markedly in June and July, and that's because we had had that high base effect. The previous year, which was 2022, was the first time that our local inflation had gone through seven in many years. So that base effect really helps. We're going to still see some base effect here. Food inflation in the U.S. is almost negative. What we've got is housing, and or shelter as they call it. And there's some base effects in that as well, and that will start to come through. But a short answer is it's a lot more sticky than perhaps anticipated. I thought we would get, looking at the U.S., to around 4% by end of last year. We got lower, closer to 3 I was surprised how quickly, but I've been saying for a long time, that move from 4 and 3 and ultimately to 2%, that takes more time. What we did see was U.S. unemployment last week as well. Uh, that moved higher, and that gives, I don't want to say some hope, but certainly for those looking for the rate cuts, higher unemployment suggests an economy that is, that is struggling. Although, man, when your unemployment is sub 4%, struggling is a relative term. However, what we have got, what we are seeing is that we are seeing unemployment creep higher. We are seeing inflation stay just above that 3%. Do we get a mid-year rate cut? I, certainly, the, the talk is that mid-year is now on the table. I think it probably is, but I think there's still some more wiggling to do. And yeah, if inflation remains sticky at this 3 odd percent, that June rate cut, mid-year rate cut, suddenly it looks frankly, a whole bunch less likely. We'll keep an eye on the data. Of course, our own MPC, uh, we've got a different story. Our economy is creaking along 0.6% GDP for last year, and we are in that target range of 3 to 6%, but our governor always talks around 45 and we're a little ways off still from that 4.5%. So let's move on to local property stocks, REITs. We had high prop on Tuesday come out and say, yeah, bad trading update, no dividend coming, and they blamed pick and pay. And what they're saying is, you know, the question is, is pick and pay going bust? Is it going to go bankrupt, go into business rescue? The answer is almost certainly not. And not because it isn't in a very, very tough space. It absolutely is. The answer is probably not going into business rescue simply because existing shareholders, bankers, etc. will help the business. Four billion rights issue, that will probably get fully subscribed. The selling off of Boxer, they'll certainly get that coming.
So they'll get that cash. But they're also in the breach of debt covenants, uh, which means that the bankers can technically call in the loans. Now, the bankers haven't. Why? Because they don't want bank, uh, pick and pay bankrupt. The last thing, if you lend someone money, you want the money back, you want the interest, please, thank you very much. The last thing you want is for that to then go bust and you now go into a whole business rescue process and you get very little at the end. You would rather take a little more risk in some cases. You would put, even put some more loan into the business. But at what rates? And we're seeing it through and through. Growth point results yesterday. Again, what's one of the stories in those numbers? Interest is costing more. We get this, right? It's costing you and I more just for our personal finances, certainly costing the companies more as well. I spoke about that a whole bunch last week. So Pick and Pay's got the higher interest burden, most likely, firstly, because their debt has doubled, and secondly, because bankers are, hey, you guys are in breach. We want a little bit more as a rate to not foreclose on you. So I don't think Pick and Pay is going bust. But if you're a landlord, you should be worried. Firstly, Pick and Pay is closing some stores and probably going to close some more, which means you're going to be left with big, cavernous spaces. Think of your local Pick and Pay. Think about how would you, if you were a landlord, now position this for somebody else. Now, maybe ShopRite comes in. Maybe a Willys or a Spa. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But if not, how do you divide that space? It's incredibly deep for the frontage it's got. It's very wide. It's not an easy space to carve up and rent out. So you've got that challenge. Secondly, Pick and Pay comes to you and says, look, you know, we're not going to leave. You're lucky you. We want to stay here. We'll sign a new lease. But at what price? Do we start to see more re rent revisions coming negative on Pick and Pay? I think we do. So as I said, High Prop mentioned in their results on Wednesday, Pick and Pay seven times. Growth Point mentioned Pick and Pay zero times times. So where is the truth? Probably, as always, somewhere in the middle. Hyprop absolutely has exposure and a fair bunch of it. Of course, they're mostly local. They've got big uh, uh, sort of marquee malls. Growth point, on the other hand, 43.5% odd is actually offshore. So that's like no worries about pick and pay. But they've still got well, the VNA waterfront has a giant pick and pay, and they've got other malls around. So certainly we've seen a recovery in the REIT space. The pick and pay story is one to watch, and it's going to get perhaps a little bit messy. Interestingly, there's correlation here with uh, Edgar's when they were going bust and how that, and in fact it was Stutterford's at the same time or a little bit earlier, but how that potentially hurt. And I thought some of the malls here up in Johannesburg, suddenly big open spaces. Uh, Edgar's exited. I notice Edgar's is coming back to Rosebank Mall. I suspect, just glancing at it, it looks like it's going to be a much smaller store. So I'm going to be keeping an eye open for these REITs as they come out with results. What is the story around their exposure to pick and pay? how they're managing it, and what do they think around it? Are they worried, or is this something which, frankly, they think is not a concern, which I think might be a brave response. Uh, I want to touch on Quantum Foods. So a bunch of you are Quantum Who. So Quantum Foods is a, they're a, a, a chicken producer amongst things. Astro had a stake in them uh, for a while there. That certainly had got the market very excited when it happened at the time. What we then subsequently saw to that is aside from uh, uh, the, the stake, there was also a country bird was interested. And Quantum Foods at that point in time did uh, spectacularly well. Let me call up the uh, screen here. Uh, there's Quantum foods so we saw the share back in uh, mid 2020 sparking up to almost 10 rand and then it drifting lower to the mid fours and then it was announced last week that astro had exited their stake uh, and and sold it it turns out to country bird lots of excitement was country bird going to do a takeover would the competition commission allow it uh, to the first point we didn't know to the second point probably not but then country bird sent a letter to quantum saying we're not going to make an offer. Don't worry. We're going to sit here on our 15%. But then a bigger shareholder with 30-odd sent a letter saying, we demand a general meeting. We want three board members gone. We want to appoint our own board members. Thing is, 
on the news of that selling of the stake from Astral across to uh, Country Bird, the stock again spiked up to around 9 Rand 50. I'm recording this now before the open on Thursday morning, and we've seen the price come back to around 9. There's no story here, folks. This price is going back to 5, 450. There's about. There is no story in that regard. It's just not going to happen. There, there, there's no excitement. The market got excited. If you made money, kudos to you. If you haven't taken your profits, I would be seriously looking to take some profits. Folks, I get a lot of questions around the software I'm, I'm using here. It is Koifin, K-O-Y-F-I-N. It is not cheap by any stretch of imagination, but it's a great piece of software. Uh, if you want... Go to my show notes, justonelap.com slash jcdirect. You will find links there. It gets you 10% uh, off your first order, and I get a $20 credit for my next payment because these payments are expensive. And someone there is asking, what about the charts of GrowthPoint? Are we seeing any valuations? So GrowthPoint on a five-year chart, uh, it's still down, but perhaps the more important chart is uh, PEs, price to books, etc. The growth point PE is just looking messy. That actually looks wrong. The price to book at 0 0.6 looks attractive. The v is absolutely a quality asset, but uh, it, it, the, 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 the yield here is perhaps the bigger story. High prop, of course, no yield because they said, thanks, but we are not going to be paying a dividend. What we've got here is a price to book of half a percent. We've got a mean PE of about 15.3. That got solidly messed up by the pandemic where PEs went to crazy numbers because earnings just vanished. That, I mean, we know what happened there. But it's looking a little better. But if we just pull up what I call the Simon Squiggles, uh, that uh, stuck. The sort of 32-ish sort of level has proving a fairly significant resistance all the way back to January of 2022. And if we zoom out earlier, again, it is still below the pre-pandemic levels. And what we need to remember with these property stocks is that the peak was actually back in 2017. In the case of high prop, close to 70 bucks a share. Things have been hurting in that regard. We have got uh, WeBuy Cars listing announced, uh, planned for 11 April will be the listing day, which means, and I'm assuming on here, if you are holding, I need to check my calendar, on Wednesday, 10 April, if you're holding transaction capital, you will get WeBuy Cars shares. The exact T's and C's still need to be announced. We had ABSA results, and they were poor. They were just a poor set of numbers. There is you know, Two things happened. So... What we saw was no growth. HEPs was up a percent. That, that's not growing by any stretch of imagination. So we had HEPs up 1%, which is boring. We then had the, the, the bad debts kind of flying. Although what we saw uh, yesterday was uh, S&P Global Ratings Agency coming out and talking about our banks. I picked this up on Business Day. Uh, face $74 billion in unpaid loans in 2024. Uh, sector losses to be almost double the historical lows. Yeah, it is, it is way tough out there for banks. Consumers obviously under pressure, corporates under pressure as well. Let's be clear about that. But there's another point there as well. As rates come down, they start to lose that jaws effect that they've been very much enjoying recently. But if we have a look at the banks relative to each other, and we look at what are we doing here? Let's look at a shorter term, a three-year return. Uh, Investec, 150% up, clear winner, Ned Bank 56, Standard Bank 43, first round 17, ABSA 13%. Uh, and uh, uh, Sasfin minus 14. I should take Sasfin off that list. It's not quite fair. These are excluding dividends. If we look at the valuations, and let's ignore Sasfin, we've got ABSA, uh, Standard Bank, and Nedbank around one times price to book, although ABSA, truthfully, is a little bit lower in that regard. We've got first round about two times price to book, and Capitec, six times price to book. So the winner here is Standard Bank. And I've got to say, Standard Bank, if I had to hold a bank, and I've got to say, I'm not sure that there's necessarily a massively compelling argument to hold a bank in this environment. And in fact, if you remember from the what, first uh, uh, JC Direct at the beginning of the year, we do our predictions, and my prediction was that I thought banks were going to have a tough time of it. But if we haul up uh, Standard Bank, 
We've got a uh, mean PE of about 10.7. Standard deviation, one below is 8.7. Current is 8.2. And uh, forward is 7.5. Standard Bank's cheap. We've got a price to book of 1.3. Okay, that's a little bit expensive relative to its peers, to be truth. Uh, And then let's go have a quick look at what the dividend is telling us. Dividend yield is 6.9. That should probably move up closer to 8% at the next set of results. Standard Bank's my preferred, but I'm not a huge fan, truthfully, of any of the banks. I think they are going to have a tougher time, and I think it's starting to look a little bit expensive there. Folks, we're going to park it there. Our next power hour is 18 August. Uh, The Standard Bank is the sponsor. It will be at Baker Street, the head office, and then, of course, webcast and video. What we have done is we're putting together the list of speakers. We're getting commodity experts. We're getting financial service experts. We're getting small cap experts, both local and offshore. We're getting tech experts to come and speak. But on the 18th, we're kicking off with getting started in shares. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. Let's start with the basics. And I know most of you listening to this podcast are, you know, I don't need any of that. Fesh out. Although maybe you do. Not because you don't know stuff, but because maybe I can you know, un- 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 uncover a nugget that will help you in that regard. Uh, it will be the 18th. I'm going to talk everything. Tax, offshore, local, ETS, platforms, the whole shing big. Booking's not up yet, but the bookings will be up probably within the next week or so. And as I said uh, last week, it will be great if everyone comes along and says, how's it? Uh, and, and, and you know what the power hours were always previously? As much as they were great speakers, they become social events, and that's what we're trying to get back together again. Anyway, that will be up in time. In the meantime, remember, justonelap.com slash retire, and if you are a retiree and you're keen to be interviewed, can be anonymous, simon at justonelap.com, and we will, I'll put you in contact with our writer. We'll leave it there for now. My name is Simon. We'll chat again next week. As always, look after yourself, and if you can, look after somebody else as well. Cheers, all.